As PlayStation came closer to launch in Europe, things were noticeably different about this console launch than the ones before it. One of the keys to these differences lay in the fact that Sony had their internal divisions in music, entertainment, and electronics, giving them a unique and powerful tool to tap directly into the sensibilities and interests of young adults. Rather than marketing themselves so heavily into the established gamers market that was already overpopulated and dominated by Nintendo and Sega's consoles, Sony leveraged the PlayStation as something more, something beyond just a gaming console. An event in itself that was cool, different, and much like getting a high-end Discman or having a super impressive sound system, a must-have for your entertainment center. This was an aspect that Nintendo and Sega simply could not compete with, as their general demographic and approach was geared towards the specific consumers of kids and young teenagers specifically looking for games. So I was working on Sega magazines in the UK back in 1994, and it was clear that a profound transition was upcoming. And I think ironically, it was Sega, not Sony, that brought it on. With its Model 1 and Model 2 arcade games, it was supremely obvious that the future of gaming was in 3D, not 2D. And the hunger to bring home titles like Virtua Fighter and Daytona USA was profound. But as the year progressed, the buzz behind PlayStation started to gain momentum. Contacts of mine started to see behind the scenes demos for PlayStation and were blown away by what they saw. The positivity was infectious and quickly spread to the press and then to gamers. Meanwhile, it wasn't so clear-cut what was actually happening with Sega. The 32X initiative didn't really have any kind of enthusiasm behind it at all. Rumours that the Saturn was being revamped to stand a chance of competing against PlayStation from a hardware level, well, those rumours just wouldn't go away. Come November 1994, Sega launched the Saturn in Japan with the product it needed to deliver. A uh, reasonably competent, if rough around the edges, port of Virtua Fighter, but it was the fast, smooth, polished, fully texture mapped Ridge Racer on PlayStation that really caught the attention of the audience. And yet, yeah, it was PlayStation that I think provided that first true next generation moment. The marketing campaign was quite different overall as Sony tapped into the more surreal and abstract to catch the eyes and turn heads. Directed primarily by the UK and French branches of Sony, these ads don't have much to do with games as a whole, but it signals a change in tone and culture, exactly how Sony wanted the PlayStation itself to be seen. The console wasn't just promoted in toy stores, but also in places where older teenagers and young adults would be. For example, my first interaction with the PlayStation was not in an electronics store, not in a toy store, not in a music shop. It was in a skateboarding shop. Perhaps most important of all was Sony's ability to leverage music to their advantage, and perhaps in no territory was this felt more than in Europe. The trends were changing, and younger adults that had grown up playing games were now growing towards a more rebellious, more underground sense of style. Much like the way that punk had grown out of the back alley clubs in the 70s, the 90s saw an emergence of techno, trance, and rave music, combining that rebellious nature of punk with the consumerism of pop. The best example of this is Prodigy, a band that would really start the fire with this generation and in many ways would go to define the sheer soundscape that so many would associate with the system and eventually even appear in the games themselves. For the system's actual launch, Sony would shuffle things around a bit in terms of lineup, heavily relying on their new internal studio at Cygnosis. Cygnosis not only had a strong pedigree in producing absolutely incredible technical showpieces in gaming, but they also had been able to assist Sony in updating the internal SDK to take full advantage of the hardware much beyond what had been seen months prior for the Japanese launch. Well, outside of Mahjong Goku Tenjiku, that is. But before getting into the actual games of the launch, there's one more piece of software we need to talk about before we get there. The Demo 1. Oh yeah.
Now, demo discs are nothing new. You can trace them all the way back to the early 80s via magazines, newsletters, and mail-in registration system. However, Demo 1 differed in just the sheer production value and the influence it will come to have on the early life of the PlayStation. Among the playable demos, Battle Arena to Shinden and the first glimpse of the upcoming Destruction Derby really showcased the 3D prowess of the system to be unlike any console before it. And among the many video previews, these were not just mere gameplay footage with a logo slapped on top, but many of them edited very similar to a music video montage, again tapping into the music side that Sony was so accustomed to. Sony actually provided a lot of guidance and assistance in the early promotion materials for publishers, and it really shows when you check out the Demo 1. Though what is perhaps most fondly remembered here is this guy. Yes, the T-Rex. This bad boy runs in real time and was an absolutely phenomenal display of the hardware. This really became the showpiece for the system in regards to its potential. And with the ominous music and the hyper-realistic dinosaur model, it really was one of those moments you'll never forget the first time you saw it. You can rotate the camera, you can zoom in and out. You can even open its mouth and overlay Richard Ledbetter's voice and post to fit in perfectly. Join our supporter program today. It's radical. Of course, we can't forget about the Mata Ray either, which is actually my personal favorite and something I would often put on in the background while I was doing homework. So much so that my dad would buy me a book about the fish for Christmas that year because he thought I was so in love with them. I actually still haven't told him the truth about all this. So the Demo 1, I really felt like we had to highlight this thing because of the sheer impact and importance it had on how Sony got the word out about their new home entertainment unit. But I think now it's time to talk about the games. But when you talk about the games in Europe, there is one thing we have to talk about. Yes, that's right, we have to talk about the PAL video standard, the analog TV standard used in Europe and other territories. PAL runs at 50 Hz with 576 displayed lines of resolution, while NTSC is 60 Hz with 480 lines. For low resolution content such as video games in the mid 90s, this becomes 288p for PAL versus 240p for NTSC, basically. Why is this an issue though? Well, a lot of games were obviously developed in Japan and North America, right? Here, we used NTSC with games running at 60Hz. If you had a title running at, say, 30 or 60 frames per second in NTSC, running at a resolution of 320 by 224 when brought to Europe, this would often run with visible borders along the top and bottom, as they had to fit the lower resolution into the higher resolution PAL output, and the frame rate would be reduced to 25 or 50 frames per second. On the surface, this wouldn't be a big deal, but the problem is game speed was often not adjusted to match. As a result, a drop from 30 to 25 frames per second not only came with decreased fluidity, but the game played slower as well. And in the 16-bit days, sometimes even the music wasn't adjusted. Listen to this. It's extremely evident with launch titles shared between regions such as Ridge Racer and Kilik. The gameplay area is squeezed vertically and the speed of play is reduced. Playing Ridge Racer at 50 Hz feels almost like driving through the mud. It's perfectly playable, but it just feels off. Kilik the Blood and Battle Arena Toshinden are just as bad, each running slower than their NTSC counterpart. These three games, by the way, are shared launch titles between Europe and North America. This is a problem that would plague a wide range of PlayStation games over the life of the system. Few developers took the time to optimize games specifically for 50 Hz. It is worth keeping in mind that doing so was not a trivial task though. And this is where European developers had a chance to really shine, which is what brings us to our first and perhaps most important game of the European PlayStation launch.
This is Wipeout, the most popular and successful game to launch alongside the PlayStation in Europe. This stands as the very first entry in a series that would persist up until the PlayStation 4, and remains one of the most beloved games to come out of Sony's European development arm. Wipeout is the creation of Psygnosis, which had just been acquired by Sony before launching the PlayStation. It's a futuristic zero-gravity racing game, something we had seen before in titles such as F-Zero, but this time it has a twist. Your ship has real inertia and physics, which players must learn to master using a pair of air brakes to tackle wild twists and turns in the track. This is a fast game and the learning curve is steep, but once you get it, it quickly becomes addictive and almost entrancing. A dance with the vicious snake-like track design as you touch the sky before plummeting down the slope all to a stunning soundtrack. And that sort of ties into its image. This is a good example of how Sony tapped into the culture of its day. Wipeout channeled the burgeoning European club scene of the mid-90s. It features a superb soundtrack primarily crafted by Cold Storage, but in its original European incarnation also includes tracks by Orbital, Left Field, and the Chemical Brothers. Wipeout also features graphic design elements by The Designers Republic, a famous British graphic design studio along with Keith Hopwood. This includes the packaging, marketing materials, and in-game logos. It's a key part of its visual identity. Wipeout even made an appearance in the film Hackers from 1995 via a pre-rendered CGI mock-up of what the game might look like. You can even see the ImageSoft logo in there. But obviously, this is a long way from what was possible on the PlayStation. The point is, Wipeout tapped into pop culture in a big way while also offering a superb and unique gameplay experience. And just as important as the gameplay, Wipeout showcased what PlayStation could do in 3D. Psygnosis was known for its technical prowess, and Wipeout showcased this well. There had never been a racing game quite like this. The steep slopes and smooth curves were unlike anything else in the market at the time and it all ran at a stable 30 frames per second. Well, that is, in the NTSC version which would follow. We've already talked about the PAL video format earlier, and Wipeout first launched in PAL territories. While it's limited to 50Hz output, the gameplay speed feels correct, and it does not suffer from issues plaguing Ridge Racer and the like. That is to say, it's properly optimized for PAL. So yeah, the audiovisual experience left a strong impact. This was one impressive and well-playing game. It's not perfect though, it did exhibit some limitations. The draw distance was limited, with obvious draw-in without fog, while PlayStation's affine texture swim, which would become very common on the system, was always evident, not to mention geometry seams were present in many tracks. It was very smooth, but it actually felt a little less solid than, say, Crystal Dynamics' Crash and Burn on the 3DO. Now keep in mind that that game uses sprites for all of its cars and weapons, while Wipeout is fully polygonal, and it also runs at a much lower frame rate, but it makes for an interesting comparison. Now as a first party published game for PlayStation, you might be surprised to learn that Wipeout was ported to other platforms as well, specifically the PC and Sega Saturn. Yes, Wipeout was released on Sega's machine by SoftBank. So let's start with that version. At a glance, it looks pretty good. Texture warping is actually reduced ever so slightly due to the way the Saturn handles its quads, and it retains the visual signature of Wipeout. But look closer and the flaws begin to appear. This is one of the first games we've examined thus far which highlights weaknesses of the Saturn's ability to handle 3D well. Firstly, the frame rate, it's lower. When comparing NTSC versions of the game, the Saturn version of Wipeout tops out at just 20 frames per second, while PlayStation delivers a stable 30. When the camera collides with the scenery, it also tends to break apart more easily, showing gaps in the track. Beyond this, Saturn lacks alpha-blended transparencies, instead relying on a dithered mesh pattern. And lastly, the distant sky is handled using Saturn's VDP2, which means it's a tile map, basically so it looks slightly cleaner than on PlayStation actually, but it only scrolls left and right, so it feels kind of less connected to the world. This wouldn't be the last Psygnosis title on Saturn either. Destruction Derby and 3D Lemmings, among others, were both being ported. None of these ports are a match for the originals on PlayStation, but they're not bad. 
On PC though, there's not just one version, there's actually two. Basically, there's this initial MS-DOS release, but there's also an exclusive Windows 95 version designed for the ATI RAGE 3D cards. We're gonna check out both today. So first, there's DOS. Curiously, this one can run straight from the CD, which is somewhat uncommon for PC games I've found, and it compares favorably. It uses DOS Mode X again, so it's a 70Hz game capped at 35 frames per second that runs in 8-bit color. This means it's lacking some of the gradients and smooth transparency of PlayStation, but otherwise it matches up surprisingly well against the console version. Clearly though, the game engine is limited by its original target, as even on PC, there's a lot of polygon sorting issues which kind of mar the image quality. You can of course dial down the visual settings though. I call this 486 mode. I remember playing it on a 486 DX2 66 MHz, and by turning down the settings, you could achieve playable frame rates. Obviously, for this video, I'm using a more powerful Pentium 3 system, which outclasses anything that would have been available in 1996. But then there's the ATI specific version of the game. I ran this on an ATI Rage Pro AGP. It supports resolutions up to 640x480 while offering features such as bilinear texture filtering. The frame rate is still, unfortunately, capped at half the refresh rate, which varies per resolution. It runs well on the Rage Pro, but I'm not a huge fan of the look. Essentially, the high resolution mode highlights the inherent polygon instability issues in this game. The sorting errors become very difficult to ignore at this resolution, and the whole game just looks wobbly and unstable as a result. I do believe this was designed for older ATI Rage cards, and I did run into some graphical issues on the Rage Pro specifically. Which is why I still recommend going with the PlayStation version above all. While its sequels would surpass the original, the original Wipeout was a critical game at launch, and one that helped define the PlayStation in Europe. If you wanted to get a little higher, though, perhaps, Namco had something else for European players. This is Air Combat, the localized version of Ace Combat as it was released in Japan. It's always interesting to reflect back on the origins of a classic series, and in this case, this is a new game derived from a 1993 arcade title, and it kind of shows. While elements that would come to define the Ace Combat series going forward are present, it feels a little bare bones compared to what would follow. You basically play through a series of missions tackling both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground targets along the way. Complete the mission, then it's back to the menu to do the next one. It's simple and fun, but it's just a taste of where the series would go from this point. It does, however, make for a nice early game release on PlayStation. Visuals are sharp and clean, the frame rate is stable, and the action reasonably fast. Flight games were hugely popular on the PC at the time, and Air Combat demonstrated what's possible on the PlayStation at this time, even if it's not necessarily one of the more impressive launch titles. It is worth noting though that PC games like MechWarrior 2 had released in 1995 and were considered cutting edge. Ace Combat's texture mapping is kind of a step above, I'd say, even if I love the aesthetic for MechWarrior 2. The presentation though is still relatively solid at least. Menus are rendered using the PlayStation's interlaced high resolution mode, and it runs at a nice frame rate. In game, the resolution is reduced and dithering is apparent when using anything other than composite or RF, but again, it works well enough. I should mention here though that, like Ridge Racer, Air Combat was not properly adapted for PAL televisions, thus it runs slower and with obvious borders, which is of course disappointing, but unfortunately, it would be the norm with Japanese developed PlayStation games. But alas, there isn't much more to say about this one, it's just a good start for what would become a brilliant series. Our next game though, is very much old school in the best possible way. Rapid Reload is yet another launch game courtesy of Media Vision, who you might remember from earlier in the episode providing Japan with the launch game title of Crime Crackers. This time around, Media Vision stays in the more familiar territory of a strictly 2D side-scrolling action game. Now you might notice that the game has a striking similarity to another game, that of Super Mario Bros. 
but look even closer and you might recognize another game as well. That's right, Rapid Reload takes a healthy dose of inspiration from Treasure's classic Mega Drive romp, Gunstar Heroes, emulating the 16-bit actioner down to a T. Now, the origins of just why this game shares so much in common with Treasure's game has been speculated on over the years, and just taking a cursory Google search showed me everything from fairies to Treasure themselves doing the game to MediaVision wanting to outdo Treasure at their own game. However, the origins for Rapid Reload seems to be much more interesting than that. Now, details are sparse on the subject, but from what I can gather from blurbs in magazines such as Famitsu, Dengeki PlayStation and other places, as well as cache Japanese sites circa 1995, Rapid Reload, or Gunner's Heaven as it's known in Japan, began as a project by Yokiote for the Super Famicom, as an attempt to bring Gunstar Heroes-like action to the 16-bit platform. Now, longtime DF Retro fans might find that name slightly familiar as it is the same developer that made Hook, Sky Blazers, and Cooley Skunk, a game that also began its life on the Super Famicom, but eventually got released on the PlayStation as Punky Skunk and did get its own episode right here on Digital Foundry. Due to circumstances that is slightly unclear to me, MediaVision seems to have come into the project at some point and helped bring it over to the PlayStation. But when you analyze the color palette, the in-game sprites, the general art direction as a whole, it is clear that the game does seem to have been destined for Nintendo's system at some point. So what about the game then? Well, as mentioned, the game takes a lot of inspiration from Gunstar Heroes, though it isn't quite that simple. The frantic, fast-paced nature of Gunstar Heroes has been slowed down a tad bit and the action focuses a bit more on precision and health conservation in comparison. Think something more akin to Metal Slug and Contra in this regard, and no doubt tied to the fact that it was originally meant for the Super Famicom's slower clock speed. You take on the role as either Alex Sonics or Luca Hetfield of the Commandos at large, Treasure Hunter is seeking the Valkyrie, a treasure that is also sought after by their rivals at the Pumpkin Heads. Apart from the interchangeable weapons such as the homing lasers, flamethrowers, neutral turrets, and the smart bombs, there's also the Gunstar Heroes-esque melee attack in close range, as well as this grappling hook which never seems to come into play in the game for some reason, at least as far as I can find. Now the biggest point of difference in this game from any contemporaries is, well, the points. Blasting your way through enemies, you'll find these diamond points being left behind that you can collect. The more points you gather, the more powered up your weapon gets, and over time, this ticks down like a timer. It's an interesting system for sure. Hidden in the crates and enemies, you also find these booster power-ups which maximizes the strength of your gun for a short period of time. Through the stages, you'll also find these area bosses before you take on the pumpkin heads themselves in the climatic boss battles. Now, in terms of content, the game is on the lighter side of things. There are six stages in all, some of them deviating from the run and gun in favor of this side-scrolling shooter-style stage. The overall game runs pretty well with massive explosions, plenty of sprites on screen at once, only occasionally dipping below the 60 like here in this flight stage, but generally staying locked and loaded. What's quite disappointing, however, is the lack of a two-player mode, despite the fact that the game has two playable characters. Seems like this would have been an obvious feature to include, but I guess there's a reason for it. Now the more interesting option in the game is this, BGM Type A and Type B. Now I've actually seen mentions online that this is a simple toggle between stereo and mono, however this is incorrect. So what is it then? Well check this out. As you can hear, it does select between two distinctly different soundtracks. So what's going on here then? Why does Rapid Reload have two soundtracks for the same game? Well, I think I have the answer actually. While Type A seems to be making full use of the CD-ROM format, playing digital sound files, featuring live instrumentations and such, Type B, however, is what I believe to have been the original compositions meant for the Super Famicom version of the game using the sample-based playback. It wouldn't have sounded this good naturally, but I'm fairly certain this is what, at the very least, was meant to be the compositions to be arranged for the SBC 700. So what are some of the differences then between the Japanese release and the European release? Well, there's actually a few notable differences on display here. For one, of course, it's the name, which in Japan plays even more into the Gunstar Heroes inspiration. Just take a look at the first initials of this name. 
But surprisingly, the biggest change in terms of content comes in the form of this voice option here. When turned on, Gunner's Heaven features fully voiced segments prior to the boss battles. Whereas in Rapid Reload, they are text only. Now the translation seems to also have been simplified in localization, and there's parts of the game where it's not even localized, like the credits. Now another tiny difference, in the Japanese version you have infinite continues, whereas in the European version you have a limit of 9 continues. But of course, as I'm sure you're expecting by now, Rapid Reload runs much slower than its Japanese NTSC counterpart, but what surprised me here is just how much slower it is. I actually had a memory of this game being quite fast from my own launch day copy, but upon revisit, it is one of those games that really, really gave the PAL format the bad name. It is baffling how slow this is. This is also one of those games that never saw release in the United States due to that famed directive to not feature 2D gaming on a new 3D system, which is a shame because I think it actually could have found an audience over there. So that's Rapid Reload. By and large, it is a good 2D action game with some superb art direction and fun fast gameplay. Well, if you have the Japanese version at least. But it is true, Gunstar Heroes it is not. But it is a fun example of how 2D gaming could be done well on the PlayStation, kind of like a Saturn-like experience for the console at this very early stage. Now some of you might have noticed a slight similarity to another media vision title, that being Wild Arms, as the art direction was done by Yukihiko Ito. The connections to Wild Arms doesn't stop there, however. If you traverse to the town of Damsen in Wild Arms, you'll find the inn called Gunner's Heaven, run by Axel Sonics. Gunner's Heaven also shoves up in Wild Arms 3 as an arena, and throughout the series, numerous weapons are named the same in Wild Arms as they show up in the manual for Gunner's Heaven, so that's pretty cool. It is pretty clear that MediaVision never forgot about their little action game here, even though many of us others did. This was actually my favorite of the launch games back then, and I still greatly enjoy today, though I think I'm going to be continuing playing this on the Japanese NTSC version, considering the slowdown. But, I will admit, I do like the name Rapid Reload better than Gunner's Heaven. If you have the chance, do check out Gunner's Heaven or Rapid Reload, whichever version you can get your hands on, as it is one of the finer early 2D games on the system. This is Nova Storm from Psygnosis, and in many ways, this is the shadow of a genre that was soon to collapse, the FMV game. Now, during the early 90s, as the CD-ROM format took off, developers started experimenting with video playback in games, but this came with serious limitations. You could only influence which clips would play next, but ultimately had little control. Developers were keen to make this work though, and a subset of FMV-driven games started finding its way to the market around 93. Games like Sylphid from Game Arts, Rebel Assault from LucasArts, Mega Race from Cryo, and Microcosm from Psygnosis. Each of these games basically combined full motion video based backgrounds with overlaid sprites. So the gameplay layer offers full control, while the FMV defines the path through the environment and worlds you'll visit. They even integrated an invisible collision system allowing you to collide with objects rendered as part of the FMV layer. It's a novel idea, but the resulting games weren't exactly great. They're more playable than the digital picture style of FMV gaming, however. Nova Storm is born directly from this and is basically from what I can tell the follow-up to Microcosm, and it found its way to the PlayStation just in time for the European launch. The idea is just as I described, you pilot a ship, represented as a series of sprites that you move around the screen while shooting into the image. You engage enemies as sprites, as well as those embedded into the FMV itself. It's extremely basic, and ultimately rather dull by today's standards, but it did highlight one of the key technical improvements PlayStation brought to the table, high quality full screen video playback. But Nova Storm was not an exclusive, rather it appeared across a wide range of platforms, including Sega CD, 3DO, FM Towns, and MS-DOS. Search for platform differences online though, and most articles simply state the PlayStation version had full screen FMV, but in reality, the differences run much deeper. Now I was first made aware of this game with the release of the MS-DOS version, for 94, Nova Storm showcased some exceptionally high quality video that, while not full screen, looked great and ran well even on a slow CD-ROM drive. 
For this video, I tested that MS-DOS version, but also the Sega CD, 3DO, and of course, PlayStation versions. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to the FM Towns version named Scavenger 4, but based on video evidence, it resembles the 3DO version most closely. Now, the core gameplay between these versions is mostly the same. You move the ship around, blasting enemies, but the underlying FMV, the HUD, the weapon effects, and the soundtrack all kind of differ between them. I have a soft spot for the Sega CD version though. The video itself has so few colors as to become nearly incomprehensible, yet this abstract look feels weirdly appealing in this case, and the actual bullet timings of the action are perhaps the most satisfying. It plays better than you'd expect. The PC also has its own advantages. While I'm not a fan of the border around the PC's video, I do appreciate how the ship itself moves at a lower frame rate. That sounds crazy, but listen, on the consoles, the player sprite updates at 60 FPS, but this looks weird as it's a mismatch for the CGI backgrounds. By reducing the frame rate of the sprite layer, the two layers sort of blend together a little nicer. The 3DO version though is kind of the odd one as the video is presented in this smallish window with a HUD only along the top and bottom, yet you can still see the edges of the video frame, so it feels a little strange. It also goes crazy with the bomb effects which cause the game to slow down to a halt and flash the screen white. Plus the second stage has this music that sounds like a dog barking. But here's where things get weird. The PlayStation version is basically a complete re-envisioning of the original Nova Storm concept. It features completely new 3D renders of everything, and that includes new challenges such as environmental hazards to dodge, which by the way, doesn't work very well. It's also the only other version, alongside the PC, to feature this gentleman during the game's introduction. Our forefathers left Earth in search of a new paradise. With them, they took the ecosystem of our world. Truth be told, I prefer the alternate introduction available on other platforms. Thought to be just software error, evidence now points to something else, something far deadlier. Come but still, the overall quality of the video assets is improved, and on paper, this sounds like a good idea. Redoing the assets means they're higher quality, and it takes advantage of PlayStation's video playback, allowing full screen videos. But the core gameplay itself is a lot less enjoyable. The main issue is that they've transitioned most enemy ships to scaled sprites that move rapidly around the screen. I found it more difficult to track their bullets and it feels more chaotic and less precise overall. Beyond this, the new sections I mentioned where you need to dodge in-world objects present in the CGI are terrible. You could easily fly left or right of these bursts of lava for instance, but whether you pass it or not depends upon where the pre-rendered camera decides to go. When you collide with it, you just get this annoying sound effect and lose life. Honestly though, all versions are rather dated by today's standards. FMV sequences such as this are ultimately nothing more than a crutch to deliver better visuals than would otherwise have been possible at the time, at the expense of everything else. While full motion video would occasionally work out in certain genres, it's just not a good fit for action games. Of the titles that employ this method, Sylph Heat is probably the best of the bunch as its FMV sequences are designed to match the in-game sprites, plus the core gameplay itself is simply more enjoyable. So how about the PAL situation then? Well this one's interesting. This is a UK developed game, but it does actually seem to run slower with visible borders along the top and bottom. But here's the thing, in this case, the slight drop in game speed actually improves the gameplay experience. It feels a little too fast in the NTSC version, so I actually prefer the PAL version in this case. Still, of all launch games released for the PlayStation, Nova Storm perhaps feels the most dated. But if you're looking for something a little more fun... I think it's safe to say that in the early stages of 3D gaming, no other genre had a tougher transition to the third dimension than the platformer games. Now there are early examples and attempts to make it work of course, such as Bug and Alpha Waves. And while there seemed to be hope on the horizon with the eventual Bubsy 3D and Super Mario 64, in 1995 the genre was still having trouble making the jump. 
In 1994, Japanese independent developer Exact focused their efforts on creating a full 3D action game for the Sharp X68 development environment system that sought to bring the polygonal action of Star Fox together with a more grounded tank-like movement. The result was one of the most technically impressive games for the X68 as a whole, with the game running incredibly well on only 10 MHz clock speed and incredible music that could be coupled with the Roland Sound Campus. The success of this game critically opened the eyes at Sony's upper management, who were eagerly seeking new talent to their roster to compete with the Nintendo and Sega juggernauts. And the discussion began to find out exactly how versatile Exact and their 3D engine was when combined with the power of the new PlayStation. Exact developed a proof of concept called Springman, which impressed Sony so much they decided to strap the rocket to the little developer and team them up with another developer, in Ultra as the feeling was that while Exact had the technical prowess to create an accelerating 3D action game, they lacked the inspiration to design a world and a character which people could connect with. Gone was the militaristic future setting of Geograph Seal, and in its place something much more bright and colorful entered the center stage. This is Jumping Flash. Controlling Robot, players take on 18 stages throughout six worlds of vertical platforming from the first-person perspective fighting the evil Baron Aloha, who according to the intro at least, is an evil scientist who frightens children and is bent on slavery, which is coincidentally Rich's Tinder profile as well. The core mechanic of the game is the double jump, much like the one seen in Geograph Seal, though now greatly enhanced to take the power of the PlayStation into account. This unique aspect allows you to gain the high ground and view the stage from above as Robert tilts his head down and gives you a clear view of what's beneath. With the increased performance and surprisingly decent view distance, this is really made for a fun time circa 1995, and the clever use of your shadow as a guiding tool makes this a relative breeze. The stages are built like small playgrounds, sandboxes of various shapes and objects that Robbie can for the most part jump on to find the jet pods before jumping onto the exit. Throughout the stages, you can also find these bonus zones, power-ups such as cherry bombs, missiles, twisters, and health increases. When on the ground, Robert can make use of his blaster, as well as look up and down with the use of the shoulder buttons, giving you the option to either use the jump mechanic or your blaster to your advantage, depending on the enemy. The stage layouts generally follow the same structure throughout the six worlds, three stages each. The first world will see you hunting jetpacks vertically, while the second stage can be sometimes this kind of dungeon crawler affair, becoming essentially a first-person shooter, while the third stage will always house a boss battle. Each world has its own specific theme, and the variety in design and stage layout is quite welcome. The music is quite excellent as well, except for this weird bagpipe song and stage 1. I'm not really sure what they were thinking there. Yeah. So while this all sounds good so far, how does it actually hold up on performance? Well, that's where things get a bit interesting. The game doesn't run on a locked frame rate. Actually, quite the opposite. The game tries to reach 60, but constantly dips into the 30s, and even at certain times dips below this, well into the 10s. This can be quite distracting when you quite literally are jumping between a platform at a higher 50, then land on the lower 20s, especially when your friend's name is John Lindman. Orienting yourself on screen can be quite tough at times as well due to the narrow view window and the early 3D controls that aren't always as responsive as you'd like. The on-screen HUD though is pretty clean with your little helper robot here, your health bar, the usual stuff. The stages as well lack a bit of inspiration halfway through the game. It's not that they're badly designed or even repeat too much in terms of complexity, that's all here but it always feels like the game is missing some sort of imaginary next step, a variation of the objective, or just something to break up this monotony. The actual graphics and design on display though are rather excellent, with Robin himself being quite well designed and likable, the simple flat shaded enemy characters having a bit of that rare style appeal with their buggy eyes and cute design. The game just oozes charm and effort and holds up pretty well in this regard, but when revisiting it in today's eyes, it feels like it just needed a tad bit more polish to reach its own potential. Speaking of potential, you might be wondering why Jumping Flash isn't more part of the Sony legacy today than he is, considering the game was a great success at launch, and a prime candidate for what was the coveted mascot role for the company. This is actually quite a good question, I don't really know why, 
though I would assume it might perhaps have something to do with a certain Kenji Ino signaling the end of his Sony deal by jumping on top of a rabbit shaped plushie in front of key Sony personnel before announcing he's going to the Sega Saturn. Yeah, we gotta do an episode of Kenji Ino, I think, another day. So that's Jumping Flash, with its origins on the Japanese home computers and its eventual rise as a launch game smash hit by late 1995. Jumping Flash does remain fun, charming, and interesting in terms of the early adoption of 3D for platformers. Two sequels were produced, Jumping Flash and Robi Mon Dieu, both on the PlayStation and the latter being a Japanese exclusive. It is a bit of a shame we never saw a Robit on the PlayStation 2, and he can certainly benefit from some sort of digital revival in these nostalgia-heavy days, but until that day comes, this is where the book closes on the Jumping Flash story. And here we are, our final game for the European PlayStation launch. Even though if we had adopted a more traditional ordering system, it may have been discussed first. The reason it's dead last though is because it's not very good. Yes, this is 3D Lemmings. Okay, let me attempt to explain first. Rewind back to well before the launch of PlayStation. You remember Lemmings, right? Sure you do. Created by Scottish developer DMA Design back in 1987, Lemmings quickly became a smash hit arriving on every platform under the sun. This addictive puzzler received numerous installments, and most of them were awesome. After Psygnosis was acquired by Sony, however, DMA Design sought another partnership and kinda went off to do its own thing. You may have heard of it. Psygnosis, however, kept the Lemmings license and tasked Clockwork Games, developers of the seminal Wiz and Liz for the Mega Drive, with creating a new Lemmings game. The intro movie says everything you need to know about the state of the industry in 1995. A desktop computer rendered in glorious CGI depicts these small rascals breaking free of their, uh, prison and becoming 3D with the push of a button. If only it were that easy. Honestly though, the concept is sound and it makes a lot of sense for the time frame. Take the Lemmings puzzle game concept and make the stages 3D. This would allow things like, say, the blockers to now direct lemmings in or out of the screen, while pathways can be used to create some truly wild designs. Problem is, this is the early days of 3D, and the controls show their age. The simple act of moving the camera around in a 3D space while focusing on a central object was new, and using multi-layered buttons on the gamepad, they kind of attempt to make it work. The problem is, it's extremely difficult to make out everything while navigating these spaces. It never feels intuitive. You have various pre-assigned camera angles, but nothing ever quite feels right. Plus, the resolution of the game is at odds with the need to view these stages from a distance. It's difficult to make the lemmings out when they're just two pixels high. It does have this rather fascinating virtual lemming option, of course, which is neat. You basically have an opportunity to experience life from the lemming's perspective. But fundamentally, this game is not fun to play. I see the appeal here, though. It's just that game design in 3D simply hadn't progressed far enough to make something like this work. If you had mastered the controls, perhaps you could have some fun with it, but it's something I was never able to find. But like other Psygnosis games of this era, 3D Lemmings would receive multiple ports. And once again, we have both PC and Sega Saturn as target platforms. Unfortunately, I could not get the Saturn version to actually run on my Saturn. It just crashed. Maybe it's trying to tell me something, but from what I remember playing of it, it runs worse than the PlayStation version. But it's the PC version that is perhaps most fascinating because it manages to partially solve some of the game's issues. It feels like a proper PC game and it's the closest 3D Lemmings comes to becoming an actual good game. Firstly, you have a mouse now. All versions rely on a cursor for selecting options just like Lemmings always has, but doing so with a D-pad while also managing the camera is extremely tedious. On PC, you can now manipulate the camera with one hand and the mouse cursor with another. Clicking on individual lemmings is a snap on PC. It's a lot more like the classic games. It also has these high resolution intermission scenes and in some ways it looks slightly better, though different is perhaps a better way to describe it. Plus, while I'm running this on a faster Pentium 3 system, it runs better too. 
perhaps a little bit too fast, but in this case the increased speed is actually beneficial as it makes the stages less tedious. Unfortunately, overall, I just don't like this game specifically on consoles, but I understand what they were going for and can respect the efforts behind it. While the PC version is reasonably decent, there's a reason future Lemmings titles would return to two dimensions. This is where they belong, inside this trash can from the intro movie. And with this, PlayStation had officially launched in each of its primary territories. From this humble selection of games, the PlayStation library would grow by leaps and bounds over the following years. Many games mentioned today would go on to receive sequels in time, while powerhouse franchises were formed or reborn on the PlayStation. In many ways, gaming as we know today was born from this era, but at the same time, much of what makes the PlayStation so special has seemingly been forgotten as well. This experimental time, a time when anything was possible, truly helped change the gaming landscape forever. And there you have it, the complete retrospective on the origins of the Sony PlayStation. What started as a partnership between Nintendo and Sony ended up changing the video game industry. Sega Saturn would unfortunately fail to catch on in the West, but it did find success in Japan where it lived a long life outperforming Nintendo's own next generation console. Indeed, in 1996, Nintendo finally unleashed its Ultra 64 project, now known as Nintendo 64. Alongside Super Mario 64, it was a revelation, but missteps ensured that it never found the same success as its predecessor. The PlayStation, in comparison, went on to sell more than 100 million units while amassing nearly 8,000 games, securing its place as one of the most successful consoles of all time. And to think, it all started with those eight games back in 1994.